Welcome to another episode of the Saints and Scholars podcast. Today we're joined by Richard Blaney, the pastor of Brannockstown Baptist Church, and really we're focusing on the history of that one church. Brannockstown has an unusual story because it has a very unusual beginning. I hope you enjoy learning about the history of that unique church. Welcome to the Saints and Scholars podcast. Today we are joined by Richard Blaney, who is the pastor of Brannockstown Baptist Church. Uh, we're really glad, uh, Richard, to have you with us. And maybe we could just start by asking you, uh, where do you come from and how did you end up in Brannockstown? And maybe even more importantly, where is Brannockstown? Uh, well, thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks for having me on the, on the podcast. Uh, where is Brannockstown? That is a question I had to ask. Um, once upon a time I had to ask it of the elder on the other end of the phone as he asked me to come and preach for a Sunday uh, in Brannockstown, County Kildare. Well, I didn't even know where County Kildare was, never mind Brannockstown. So that was an embarrassing moment. Uh, But, um, uh, well, we'll get to Brannockstown. I'm I'm from Coleraine, uh, which is right up the north coast uh, of Ireland, more or less. Uh, Lived there, grew up there, uh, moved over to a couple of different spots in England. I was in Cambridge for a little while and also uh, up north in Newcastle and Gateshead, uh, lived there. Uh, all my, uh, my three children were born there. They're all English. It's a very, very sad uh, part, of our, part of our lives. Um, moved back to Coleraine uh, again uh, to study at the Irish Baptist College uh, and worked as assistant pastor in Coleraine Baptist for a couple of years uh, and then accepted a call down to, to Brannockstown. Um, how did I end up here? Uh, well, when I was at the college, the, the church here was was vacant, didn't have a pastor. Uh, they were, the church was here and some of the elders were in touch with uh, with the college to ask for some students to come down and cover a Sunday uh, and kind of enjoy fellowship and, and, and uh, get to know the church. I did that several times, I think, during the two years that I was assistant pastor in Coleraine. Uh, and... You know, in the in the Baptist way, one thing led to another. Conversations developed, and uh, eventually that led to uh, a call from the members of the church here to to come and, and be the pastor. It's a lovely part of the world, um, just about uh, what three quarters of an hour uh, southwest of Dublin. Um, really uh, beautiful, just rolling countryside. We can see the Wicklow Mountains uh, when we get out out onto the road outside the house. Uh, we're surrounded by farms and stud farms. Every morning I walk the dog, I see uh, race horses of the future uh, running up and down the gallops uh, in, in, in one of the fields nearby, uh, really only lacking a good coastline. Um, but uh, I guess we were spoiled a little bit uh, growing up the north coast, mm-hmm. uh, spoiled in that department. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's Brannock's time. That's me. Uh, sounds like a beautiful part of the world. Um... The church itself was founded in 1870 by John Latouche. Now, that doesn't sound uh, at all uh, Celtic. Uh, can you explain to us how did uh, he come to be in Ireland? And even more importantly, what moved him then to start a Baptist work in Kildare? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> so no, Latouche is not a, it's not a Celtic name. Uh, it's, it's a French name. Uh, we we presume we're pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> uh, the the Latouche, I think it was the De Latouche family at that time, but let's just say Latouche. The, the, the Latouche family was was a wealthy and influential part of the, the upper echelons of French society in the 1600s, um, part of the court of Louis the Fourteenth. Um, uh, but that's also a time when there was state prosecution uh, persecution of uh, of Protestants, the Huguenots. Uh, and that prompted part of the, the Latouche family to flee France, along with, with many others. Uh, one, one of the family came and, and settled in Ireland, in Dublin, uh, and he um, linked up with other Huguenots, kept valuables and cash for them. And those were the beginnings of uh, what would become one of the most um, uh, particular and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, famous um, banks, private banks uh, of, uh, of Ireland at that time, not in existence anymore, but, uh, but through that, the family became wealthy landowners, um, uh, took up the titles that, that went along with that, the influence in parliament and, and society that, that came along with that. 
uh, and settled in, in Kildare's Harristown estate, which uh, became the family seat um, in the, the 1700s. Not, not, a, not an idea that we, um, <clears throat> we think about much, the family seat, uh, but um, I guess if, that's, if those are the circles you move in. Um, Harristown is a beautiful spot. It's, uh, it's just, uh, just out, out the door from, from me here. Um, there's a, a set of gates to the estate, uh, just a couple of hundred yards uh, along the road. A uh, beautiful, uh, large estate, farmland, forested land. The River Liffey runs through it. Um, the, the River Liffey runs actually below the main house on the estate. There used to be a lake down there for boating and, and other uh, water sports. Um, uh, other water sports of Victorian times, <laughs> not confuse ourselves, <laughs> uh, not to imagine jet skis. Uh, but uh, the estate then passed through the family. It reached John Latouche in uh, 1844. He's the, the kind of focus of a lot of the early history of, of Brannockstown Baptist Church. Uh, 1844, he was a young man in his 20s, uh, uh, newly married to Maria, uh, who was an enthusiastic writer. It's actually her letters which provide a great deal of what's known today of, of that time uh, um, and provide a great deal of colour. Uh, of the time as well. Um, uh, I suppose the Latouches, well, I can't speak for Maria, but, but John Latouche is described as, um, as, as more of a church goer than necessarily a, a, an all out kind of um, born, well, we'd say born again Christian. Um, I don't know how fair that is, but uh, it's, it's what we've read anyway. Uh, and uh, there was a family association, a sort of long family tie with the Church of Ireland, and he'd have been uh, he'd have been regular uh, at a, a little church that was also on his estate. Um, the, the family used to winter in London, as you do. <laughs> uh, and around 1860, maybe a little earlier than 1860, he made the acquaintance uh, of um, someone well known to Baptists, uh, the Reverend Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle uh, pastor, a uh, famous preacher. Um, and uh, he started to listen to, uh, to Spurgeon preach. And at some point, we think possibly a few years later, maybe in the early 1860s, uh, the gospel really struck home and changed John Latouche's life. Um, one writer comments about a, you know, a rich Irish banker, a former master of the, the Kildare Hounds, that's, that's fox hunting to you and me. Uh, he recently found the light and became uh, converted and rebaptized by um, what did he say? The fire-breathing evangelist, uh, the Reverend C.H. Spurgeon, uh, possibly one of my, my favorite phrases that I've come across in recent readings. <laughs> um, Latouche quickly got involved with Christian relief work in London, uh, working to, um, to, to, I guess, liberate young women from prostitution, around 500 of them, in fact, I think. Uh, and then he, he did some work with the London City Mission, but as well as, as the needs of people you know, in the, in the big city, uh, he also turned his heart and his mind to people at home in County Kildare, the people around uh, his estate and people who worked for him and, uh, and worked on the land around, around his properties. Um, so around 1870, uh, Latouche began to gather a group of tenants and neighbours for Bible studies uh, at, at Harristown House. You might imagine Harristown, uh, maybe some of your listeners would be... Um, familiar with the National Trust, you know, a kind of small, grand National Trust kind of property. Imagine going there, invited up for a Bible study. Uh, later, those would have met in a cottage in the village. Uh, and I think, I think John Latouche carried out a lot of pastoral duties himself, uh, particularly uh, that of, of teaching the congregation that was gathering. Um, records are a little, uh, a little um, scarce for the exact uh, date of the start of the church, and, and often these things are, are, are organic, aren't they? But um, certainly by, by 1873, there's a record of, uh, of meetings sort of well underway. So uh, we, tend to, we tend to round down and say 1870 was, was more or less the, the beginnings of the church, uh, which is 150 years ago, uh, last year. Uh, yeah. No, that, that's really helpful. It's such an unusual story, I guess, for Irish Baptists uh, in that, uh, you know, to have really the conversion and then so much of the early portion of the church uh, driven by, I guess, a man who's really very much part of the upper class 
you know, we, we don't have too many upper class Baptists, but uh, he certainly was. In what way do you, did that um, influence the building and even the dynamics of the church fellowship and uh, for of Bramickstown? Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly very unusual, isn't it? And um, you you and I both know of Baptist churches starting in Ireland um, recently and over over um, over decades and and so on. Others being planted as we speak. Uh, but um, well, I for one don't know of any others with a story even similar uh, to that of of Brannockstown here. It, certainly, John Latouche put a lot of his own time and energy into establishing. The, the church family. He really was a driving force uh, behind it. Uh, we might imagine, you know, someone with a lot of um, a lot of uh, financial clout, for example, uh, being something of a benefactor. But he really was a uh, a driver of 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 that evangelistic work and 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 something of a pastor to the to the early uh, early congregation. Um, he, he put a good deal of his money into it as well, uh, building a, a little chapel just next door to me here. Um, it was said to seat around 120. Um, I, I think we've all we've all grown a little bit since then. Uh, probably 100 would be the most you could fit into it uh, these days. Also built a, a generous uh, manse next door. Two very, very handsome buildings. Um, I think the church building, never mind the story, the building itself would be quite unusual in, in Baptist circles uh, these days in Ireland. It's a kind of Gothic, uh, Gothic style chapel with a, a, a huge uh, spire. There's no bell in it. I had a little look into it recently, uh, trying to find the source of some damp. Uh, uh, there's no bell in there, but there is there's certainly room for one uh, in the sandstone, this red spire steep slated roof and, and stained glass windows uh, but look it's been fitted out it has uh, central heating and, and sound system and all the rest it serves us very well still today keeps us warm and dry uh, most of the year um, he, he also John Latouche also employed pastors uh, for the church uh, until the early part of the 20th century and I think he also uh, left a provision for the church in his uh, in his will uh, for the funding of, of things he would employ quite a few pastors um, from Great Britain and Ireland, mostly uh, not for very long at a time, uh, usually maybe a year or two. Perhaps it was, uh, perhaps that was how he got people to, to come. It was, uh, you know, come and, and serve for a short time uh, before you move on. The question remains, I guess, over whether any of the congregation felt compelled uh, to come along to the services after all, here's here's the landlord, uh, here is the employer, uh, here's the here's the man uh, you know on whom livelihoods hang. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any real evidence of of you know any coercion or, or whatnot. Although of course you, you know the pressure that people feel and perceive uh, could could certainly have been there. There is though an anecdote. Uh, of of Latouche's authority being brought to bear and this sort of landlordly authority uh, on, on at least one pastor. Um, I'll share it just because I enjoy the story. Um, so uh, he's reputed to have invited one pastor to tea up at Harris Town House, suggesting afterwards a time of prayer together. Nothing unusual there, except that uh, as they prayed, the master asked God uh, to open a suitable sphere of service for our brother who is now concluding his ministry amongst us. <laughs> and that was notice served. <laughs> the poor pastor went home to pack. Uh, although I, I, I can happily report that the Baptist patterns of, uh, of congregational government have uh, certainly been added to the, the foundation of, of Baptist doctrine and, and teaching. <laughs> Yeah, you, you haven't had one of those prayer meetings in your time at Braddock's. Not so far, but uh, <laughs> we have a prayer meeting now tomorrow night, so we'll see. <laughs> well, I'll be praying it goes well. <laughs> uh, through the years, you mentioned there, the, the early stages, there was a lot of pastors in a short space of time. The, the church has been served by various men. Are there any that uh, in particular stand out to you? And in what way did they... Uh, shape or develop the ministry there in Brannockstown? Yeah, so again, rec records are a little scarce for the very earliest years of the church. One of one of the pastors in those early days was uh, was an Archibald McCaig, a uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish pastor. 
Um, he he might be known to, to people familiar with Spurgeon's College. He graduated from there and returned there to teach for many years. Um, there was another pastor by the name of Ambrose Berry. Uh, he was a pastor when John Latouche died, I think, in 1904. Um, he was also an assistant pastor at what was then Harcourt Street Baptist Church in Dublin, uh, which meets today in Grosvenor Road. Um, I think he was the only Kildare native to pastor the church, uh, still to this day, I think. Uh, stand to be corrected, but, um, uh, but I, I believe so. There certainly hasn't been a strong Baptist work in Kildare uh, over, over the centuries. Uh, uh, Barry went on to become the principal of the Irish Baptist College, which I think in those days were, uh, met in, in Dublin. Um, and, uh, well, we leave it to, to others to decide. If that's a if that's a promotion, um, the the church did struggle, I, I guess, in the early decades of the twentieth century. Uh, there were a lot of lay preachers, and uh, there was help from the local Presbyterian and Methodist ministers to keep services going, to make sure that God's word at least could continue to be preached. Um, students of the Irish Baptist College in Dublin also made the, the trip out to undertake preaching duties for for many years, which. Uh, you know, in the days before uh, comfortable cars and, and uh, smooth motorways, uh, it's quite a commitment. Uh, in 1947, one of those students, um, J.A. Ritchie, became the first full-time pastor, I think, since the death of John Latouche. Uh, so that's, what, just over 40 years without a full-time pastor. It's a long, that's a long vacancy. Mm-hmm. Um, pastor Ritchie's widow actually wrote to me in 2016, uh, very warmly from her home in Scotland uh, to, uh, to just say that how dear the church was to her and to, to wish us God's blessing uh, in the work. So uh, that, was a, that was very special. Um, in 1964, uh, the, the church called a young man to the pastor by the name of Robert Dunlop. He was a Baptist home mission worker uh, for Irish ba- for, uh, Baptist missions in, uh, in Athlone. Uh, he, uh, he served as the pastor until his retirement in 2006, which, uh, to, to help with the maths, is a remarkable stretch of 42 years. Now, I'm not going to admit what age I would have to reach to break the 42-year barrier as, uh, as pastor. Suffice to say that if Robert's record is ever broken, it won't be by me. Uh, I'll be long retired by then, I hope. Um, and, and in Robert's time, look, there were... There were all sorts of of initiatives, but I think one sort of thread that would tie them together would be really the evangelistic fervor of the church uh, and and commitment to to outreach and to discipleship under his leadership. So um, a Christian Endeavor Society was started for fellowship for the the younger folks in the congregation. Um, There was a Boys Brigade company uh, started, which... Uh, it's pretty unusual in Baptist circles at all, um, certainly uh, south of the border. Um, they began a summer camp with, you know, 50 or 80 children coming along to, to, to hear about Jesus and, and to enjoy all sorts of fun. He uh, featured regularly, I, I believe, on radio, uh, on radio for RTE, uh, quite often invited to take part in, uh, in that and, and often would speak of, of God's great salvation. Uh, again, using that opportunity for for the gospel, um, and perhaps um, most fondly and widely remembered amongst the the initiatives of the church of that time was the church mobile. Um, so you need to really ima- need, need to really get your imagination going for this. Uh, imagine a single decker bus um, decorated on the outside to resemble an own, an old stone church. Complete with, I, I believe, a retractable spire. Uh, from the pictures I've seen, it definitely wouldn't pass under railway bridges and, and whatnot. But I believe they could attach this spire to the top. Uh, it was kitted out on the inside with seats and a little pulpit, uh, and I think some sort of um, keyboard or, or electric organ or whatever whatever was available in, at the time in the seventies. Uh, and look, services and meetings and evangelistic work would be taken on the road, literally on the road to, uh, to fairs and villages and towns. I think it ran and operated for about 12 years uh, and established an, a number of regular works, uh, including one uh, just south of here in County Carlow, 
you know, really trying to establish, um, I, I guess, what we would call kind of church planting activities, the, the sort of precursors to, to establishing uh, little groups and, and congregations and churches. And, and, and so that, that really stands out to me for the, the commitment to outreach um, uh, far and wide. Um, maybe we wouldn't copy the method nowadays, but I think we've just got so much to learn from, from both the creativity that went into that uh, and also the commitment to it. It obviously can't have been cheap. Uh, it, it's, it's ambitious. Um, it, it's, it's creative. It's interesting. Uh, and that's for the sake of the gospel. So that, that, that made a big impression on me, although I never saw the bus itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen some fantastic pictures. And a lot of folks who, who speak to me about Brannockstown and perhaps remember coming here for summer camps and whatnot and, and Baptist youth teams. Uh, some of some of the older older folks, you know, they can remember seeing the seeing the church mobile and uh, and it making quite an impression on them as well. Very good. Uh, that 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 is uh, a good snapshot, and even just to hear that uh, zeal, especially for evangelism, that's marked the last decades of the church. The church is still there, 150 years on. What, what, what does the church look like today? And uh, what, what are the hopes as pastor of the church for the uh, for Brannockstown moving forward? How can we be praying for the work? Yeah, thank you. We don't have, um, <clears throat> we certainly don't have any, um, you know, parliamentarians and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, landlords uh, amongst us, but uh, we're a group of, I think, 27 members at the moment. There would be around 40 adults and maybe 30 children at meeting each week uh, on, on regular Sundays. Obviously, um, as we record this, we're, God willing, coming out of a, a season of pandemic. So uh, so for a lot of the time, certainly over, over the occasion of our anniversary, we've not been meeting, uh, not physically at least, um, but uh, but that that's us. We, we're we're thinly spread out. A lot of rural churches and congregations down in, in Ireland would be fairly thinly spread. Uh, so we make the most of our times together. You know, we have a Sunday service, just the one uh, in the mornings, and, and spend almost as long over coffee afterwards as we spend on the service itself. We're a multicultural bunch. Uh, there are accents among us from Canada, uh, the United States, Colombia, Chile. Um, Nigeria, Germany, and of course, you know, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, even a few Irish voices as well. <laughs> it's a, it, it's a, a, a kind of sort of an enriching um, diversity amongst us and, and, uh, and certainly makes for an exciting, uh, exciting bring and share lunch as well. Um, we have what a lot of churches have. We, we meet midweek to pray or to study the Bible. Uh, we have little reading groups for the men and the women in the church. Uh, We've, um, we've, we've put a lot of effort recently in, in recent years into a youth club. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the youth who come to that wouldn't have any other connection with the church. Their families aren't part of the church. Um, same with our toddler group. It's often quite small, but uh, it's been a source of some, some great relationships and a nice chance to build friendship with the community. Um, the summer camp that started in the 70s still runs today. I don't know if it's run unbroken since that time. Uh, well, I suppose we've missed, the, missed last year's and this year's with the pandemic, but um, we, we enjoy having by teams along to help with that, and, and they've enjoyed themselves here as well. Um, we, we sometimes would hold events with, alongside the local, uh, local village committee uh, just to kind of get people together and, and have some sort of special occasion. Um, it would be great to pray, I, I guess, that we would recover and renew our fellowship uh, and our love for one another after the isolation of, of COVID restrictions. You know, I suppose uh, we've really missed the likes of that coffee time after church, the chance to, to mingle and for, for generations um, to, to mingle as well, uh, not just sort of friendship groups within the church and the, the people who naturally bump into each other or, uh, or phone around each other, but uh, to have those links between the generations as well. Uh, it'd be great to pray that we renew our, our fellowship. Um, uh, the, the church family, look, has put a great effort into meeting online. We've had superb uptake with certain softwares uh, that um, <laughs> a year and a half ago none of us had heard of. 
uh, well, we've we've had great uptake with that, but it takes its toll. All the same, meeting meeting online, uh, it'd be great to pray as well that we would you know renew and redouble our efforts to reach those around us as well. There's a, a great legacy of evangelistic uh, fervor in Braddock's town, uh, and we're we're a comfortable size in, in some ways. Uh, once people come back, and if we're still social distancing, it's it's difficult. It's going to be difficult to fit people on site for a Sunday service, but. There are thousands and thousands of people within reach of our church family and our church building. We, we need to kind of reconnect, I think, to the, the historic enthusiasm for sharing the love of God in Christ. Uh, so it'd be great to pray for, for those two things. I, I, the last thing I want to ask you about is, uh, you know, you, you were sharing before something about uh, a recent development in the church and especially in light of you know, Brannock Sound having such a close connection to France and really Christians fleeing persecution in France, ending up in Ireland. Uh, and now uh, you as a church are about to return the favour. Can you just let us all know a little bit about that good news? Uh, yes. Uh, well, midsummer this year, we're, we're saying, well, I suppose, au revoir to, uh, to a family that's been really very much at the heart of our church life for many years. Uh, David and Hannah Sandel and, and their three girls are moving to central France um, and, and we're sending them there um, in, in response to what we believe to be the call of God uh, and in partnership with the, the other churches of our association of, of Baptist churches in Ireland uh, through uh, through Baptist missions. Uh, David and Hannah have a long-standing love for France and, uh, and a deep desire to serve the Lord so, so they're going to settle there for two years initially uh, to focus on learning the language alongside some other missionaries uh, and helping helping them in, in the work that's established there, uh, joining in, in outreach activities and putting putting language skills into, into practice, uh, lear learning in the classroom and then <laughs> learning, learning in real life as well. I, I doubt very much that they will start a prestigious bank or become wealthy landowners. I don't think they'll fund the building of a Baptist church in a Gothic style, uh, but we're certainly praying that they'll be used by God to help call people to himself uh, through the Lord Jesus and to build the kingdom of Jesus as he builds his church. And it would be really wonderful if uh, folks tuning in could pray for David and Hannah and their daughters uh, as they make final preparations and, and set off very soon. Richard, we will be, and it's, uh, it's exciting to hear about Brannockstown sending others out into the mission field. So I uh, know we're all uh, in the Baptist churches here in Ireland. We're rejoicing in that and uh, looking forward to seeing how God will use that family there in uh, France. It's been good to also hear from you and uh, to get to know Brannockstown a little bit better. Uh, Richard uh, presented a, uh, I guess, a, a lecture to the Irish uh, Baptist Historical Society not very long ago. And uh, I'm going to put the link in the bio uh, to that YouTube video so if people are itching they can go and get more information and they can also go and find the church website and anytime anybody's in Kildare we can pop around and find this unusual building uh, with God's people inside thanks very much Richard for your time today thanks so much for having me